Welcome to my talk, which aims to be a bit of a, a guideline to, to get you started with mapping in your domain. My name is Tom Asel. I work for freelance as a software developer, architect, trainer, consultant. So my domain is around centered around software development, centered around software architecture. And I, I'd like to share some insights that I gained when I applied Wardley mapping to my domain for the first time. I do it frequently in the meantime. And as I said earlier, I'd like to have a discussion later on on your experience. But yeah, first of all, I'd like to give a, a short introduction on how to get started with Wardley mapping in your domain. So the first question that I'd like to ask is, what is your domain? Is it anything of these? Do these pictures look familiar to you? If you're following Simon's Twitter, then you probably know these pictures. The chances are that your domain looks uh, very different to what you may have seen from mapping so far. So it's not just taking one of Simon's maps, fiddling around with it, and you're done. So that's good news, as mapping is a lot more insightful and fun uh, than just repeating what others did. So it's not just taking a given map and uh, putting names of, of components on it and, and you're done. You have to create maps uh, that produce any kind of value. Um, applying mapping to particular domain may cause a lot of headaches. So let's look at some recipes to get you started. Let's do so by uh, looking at my domain and how I got started with mapping. So architects deal with the building blocks of software systems, their characteristics, their relationships among them. We produce fancy pictures that look a bit, little bit like this, more or less. And what does all that has to do with strategy? Well, first of all, architectural decisions are long lasting, which makes them expensive to change later on. Thus architectural decisions are strategic by nature. And this is where Wardley mapping uh, comes in. Some terms from Wardley mapping are also uh, used in architecture. Evolution, for example, has a certain meaning in architecture, and it is even a concept that can be mapped very well. But it's not really, at least in my experience, uh, a no-brainer. So it's always a good idea to start with some considerations up front to get us started with mapping in a certain domain. And here's my short list of advice to get started with mapping in any domain. We need to make some considerations up front yeah? to, get, um, to get us focused for a specific context. Um, so let's explore our domain first. That could be done like this. Purpose, scope, user needs. As simple as that. Just use the schema on the right as a template to visualize the landscape you want to map. Take some time to formulate the purpose of your team, your organization, or whatever it is that you're a part of, and to set the scope. What is in scope, what is not. What's not in scope will not be added to the map, uh, at least at the beginning. We can add it later. This helps us to get started, to, to start with a fresh, clean map and to not complicate, overcomplicate things in the beginning. Take especially some time to think about the users in your specific context, in your domain. Which of them are in scope? Remember, users may not only be the end customers, but all kinds of stakeholders. So for example, in software development, the software development team, the developers themselves are uh, a valid group of users that can be mapped, that may be very helpful to add this perspective to a lot of our maps. Finally, what are their needs? This is where mapping starts. So let's look at this template. And you see there's lots of space for a why of purpose or mission statement. There's lots of space for the considerations about the scope and further investigations of the users and their needs. This could be anything like this. So let's start small. My first uh, advice is to start with a small uh, scope. Choose a promising starting point. Skip the others for now. Your work will not have been wasted. Keep your notes. We can add all this stuff later on in the map. As an example, this is what purpose scope users needs may look like in the domain of software development. Well, you see 
there's our mission statement or why of purpose, something about why we're doing this, what we want to achieve. And there's also a description of what will be in scope for a map and what will be left out intentionally, um, at least for the beginning. So we're focusing on a special group of users, in this case, the developers and their needs. That's a good idea to, to start with just a single user. Start small. Uh, just one single user view needs, ideally just one need. We can add others more if the map proves to be valuable, only if it proves to be valuable. One of the things to keep in mind when mapping is no map is ever perfect. Don't strive for perfection. Don't try to make a huge map with all the stuff that comes uh, in mind from your domain. That's possibly a mistake that I did a lot of times. You'll end up with a messy map and no value gain at all. So start small, single user, only a few needs. And if that seems to be valuable, improve your map, improve your value chain, improve what you're doing now and add more capabilities. Collect all the potentially useful capabilities from your domain and add them later on. If your map doesn't uh, seem to be valuable at this point, it's no problem. Start over with a better version. Mapping is done incremental, so it should never be uh, an end in, in itself. A map should always provide value, and if it doesn't, it's okay to just discard it. At least we learned something about our domain this way. But if we manage to start with a clean map, start small, it makes things very much easier to further with, with mapping further down the line. So easy to understand maps are the ones that we want to, to start with to further put other capabilities in. We move from a clear value chain to a map by adding the perspective of evolution. So naturally, this is easier with a small map where we may add more content later on. So the next thing that I'd like to point out is the characteristics of evolution. These are context specific and we need to reason about what evolution means in our domain, in our special context. So we all know that picture. We all know that characteristics change as capabilities evolve. But what does this mean in your domain? How does evolution work in your domain? Question, what is the state of evolution for this? Yeah. Well, that depends on the characteristics. The characteristics of an architectural component are, of course, very different from those of a car or any other good or service that you're providing. So it comes all down to the characteristics of the stuff that we are mapping. Find those characteristics and describe them. And in case you're curious about the fancy symbol that I'm using here, that is a domain specific symbol for software components. And this helps to clarify that this component uh, that I put on my map is different from other components, different from products, for example, or different from other stuff that we'd like to map. I encourage you to do as well with capabilities that are special for your domain. Use special symbols. Let them visually apart from other things on your map. So we were talking about characteristics of the components because that is what makes up evolution in our context and our domain. So let's look at what characterization of evolution means. Collect all the relevant characteristics from your domain. Collect everything that could describe evolution of components within your domain or maybe just for the map that you're producing. What you see here are examples of characteristics that are helpful within my context. And if you're working in the same domain, if you're a developer, software developer also, but in other, in other context, you might, you might find others more helpful. That's totally fine. Maps are always context specific. So find the specific characteristics within your project, within your system, within your domain. Think about them and collect them, brainstorm them, make them available to others so they can challenge your assumptions. Why is that important for you? Why do you think this is more important than anything else? Why don't you have this characteristics on, on your map? 
we need to remember that these characteristics are specific for for certain components and these characteristics will change as the component evolves so all these characteristics that i put here in this picture are characteristics that a special component in a software system in my context might have and there are others that i ignored for any reason because i just forgot them or because they don't uh, make any sense for the picture that i'd like to draw that's how I characterize evolution in a certain context for my project. So the next thing is when we want to characterize evolution, we have to find appropriate names for the stages of evolution. Not everything uh, fits in the well-known scheme of genesis, custom, product, commodity. When we are describing architectural components, this is especially true. So we need to find labels for the stages of evolution so others can uh, understand what we uh, want to describe when we say a, co a component evolves. All these characteristics that uh, we saw earlier change as these capabilities evolve and these labels on our stages of evolution should deflect this. So it's helpful to label the stages appropriate. Simon showed this earlier in his keynote. It's key to apply the right labels to the stages of evolution to transport, to communicate the concept of evolution for, for your context to others, especially to people that have never seen Wardley map before. Evolution is sometimes a very new concept, uh, so we, it has to have some meaning within our project, within our, con our context, within our domain. So a map from my domain could look like this. This is a map of a software system. So it's not a dependency graph. It's not an architectural diagram. It doesn't tell anything about the internal structure of a software system. And you don't have to be a developer to understand this. These are strategic um, relevant components from the software system. And I want to map them in uh, a Wardley map. As you can see here, I chose the maintenance team as an anchor, not the customer. The maintenance team is a user within my domain. It's a user within my context. Let's take some time and look at this map, see what we can find here. So we have custom names for evolutionary stages. These stages, these names should describe the level of evolution, the stage of evolution that these software components are in. And it starts with experimental, something new, something novel that is being uh, developed, starts in this stage of experimental, develops further to a state where it is usable to us, can make any use of this component. And maybe later on, this could be used efficiently. And if it is fully evolved, we are able to um, do some planning on it. Sustainable planning is the, is the final stage that we might reach here. What you see here is that there's a single component with, within the last stage, within the stage of sustainable planning, a message broker, which is some commercial off the shelf system, something we bought. We didn't make this on our, on our own. It is something that we, we use as a third party component. But there's another thing that is experimental, which is some kind of AI advisor for a system. So you see there are other components that were named after their purpose in the, in the architecture. There's some kind of API. There's a component dealing with contract handling. There's adapter component. We don't have to go into de too much detail, but what you can also see here is we, it's easy for us to mark some areas of interest, uh, for example, to point out some risks or chances. So the red area obviously is, is a risk. And you also see that there's a movement so this map tells us that the web UI should develop further from the stage of being usable to the stage of being efficient. And there's also some inertia, something that hinders this, this, this movement, this evolution. Lack of knowledge was identified as inertia here. And that's why we are marking this area as a risk. So this map can easily be shown to somebody else just to get feedback, just to challenge our assumptions. A few words are enough to explain the opportunities and the risks. In fact, we can communicate a strategy. A strategy is already visualized here. 
and the map helps us to communicate it. The strategy here is very simple. It just has a, uh, a single element of movement, but I think you get the idea. So the next thing to look at is to ask what forces drive evolution within your domain. Simon described in this book, one of the patterns, the patterns that he described is everything evolves through supply and demand competition. So the market is the ultimate force that drives evolution. But ask yourself, is it also true for every other domain? Is it true for my domain? Of course, market and its dynamics have an impact on the capabilities in the domain of software architecture as well. But it's not the only driving force. So it makes sense to think about influences that affect evolution in your domain. What drives evolution in your domain? What could be of interest when you're talking about evolution in a certain domain, in your domain? So my advice is to investigate specific effects in your domain that impact evolution. You may find something that acts as an accelerator or as de-accelerator, something that works actively against a movement aimed at evolution. What enables or hinders movement? There are likely effects in your domain that influence evolution. So what are they? Let's look at a map again. For example, products like a platform evolves through competition. The market is the force that is driving this evolution, but other types of, of capabilities like our architectural building blocks in my domain uh, or of software systems or anything else may be affected by other forces. For example, a well-known phenomenon in software architecture is called software aging. And it's closely related to the red queen paradox and that you may also be familiar with. Without going too much into detail, how these are interconnected and related concepts. What I want to show here is that this is an example for a domain, a specific effect in my domain that affects components. Something that works against any force, against any movement uh, that we're trying to do, anything that we, we, we want to achieve to evolve this component further. So we might find any things like uh, inertia, past success, past success breeds inertia, as you know. And these are effects that are working, that are, that are affecting the evolution of components within our domain. Think about similar effects in your domain. Know them, investigate if they do affect evolution, and if so, how. If you manage to find out how evolution is affected, you may find a way around it. You may find a strategy to further develop your components, to further foster evolution in your context. So it all boils down to what do we have on the map? What are the components that we want to evolve? So it's key to look at the types of capabilities that are re relevant within our context. So I found it very helpful to distinguish the different types of capabilities that might end up on my maps. For example, one of the most beneficial ideas for me was to map the understanding of certain parts of a given context. For example, a software system or a project, a domain. So my advice is to make maps of your understanding. Choose your team, choose yourself, choose your organization as an anchor. Visibility means the relevancy for your team or for yourself or for your context. Evolution means the degree of understanding. Choose the names for the stages of evolution, put appropriate labels on it. We had this earlier. Movement means what can be done to improve your understanding of a certain component, of a certain thing, anything from your domain. So let's look at an example. The question here is, can we provide maintenance for a given system uh, ourselves? So a development team is tasked to provide well, this with maintenance for a given system. And a question that we might ask the developers is, how well do you understand the essential building blocks of the software system? So what we're mapping here is not the maturity of the software components itself, 
we are mapping our understanding of these software components, which, which is very important when we are in charge of providing maintenance or if we have to do some uh, development work on this. So we're mapping our understanding of these special, of these certain components. So the setting calls for risk management and the map can provide us with further details on the landscape. So we can find components that poorly understood, which imposes a risk on our project. A map could be very helpful to communicate this. So here we see context specific description of evolution. So we're choosing the practice labels for the evolution axis, novel, emerging, good or best. So as you can see here, our understanding of the COTS component, the message broker is very good because it is based on standards. Or people know these standards, so it's easy for them to deal uh, with this component, with this message broker. But they do not know so much about, for example, the authorization component. The knowledge about this component, the understanding about this component is rather emerging. So this doesn't say anything about if this is good or bad, but it helps us to get to find some kind of situational awareness. It tells us where we are now. And we could use this map to discuss with others if we have to do something, if we have to move on this map, if we have to further evolve our understanding of some of these building blocks. So this map is about gaining situational awareness. It doesn't tell us anything about strategy, but it helps us to challenge assumptions. I could use this map to talk to the developers and ask them, okay, is it important for you to understand this component? Why is it important? Which components are missing? And so on. Challenge assumptions, something that gets really, really easy. It's easily done with a map because we're visualizing all that stuff that is normally uh, dug within our heads. This map does not tell anything about how to improve our knowledge yet. There's no movement yet. So let's dig deeper, focus on the most important part here, which is the contractor module. The thing that in, the, in, this, in this yellow circle, this is a key component within the software system. So let's dig deeper. When we are analyzing software components, when we're analyzing architectural building blocks, we find uh, a lot of capabilities, not only just our understanding. There's software that's used, stuff that we buy, stuff that we use from other third-party components, things uh, with characteristic like products. There's understanding and there's artifacts, stuff that we build ourselves. So let's use different symbols for different types of capabilities. Let's distinguish between products, understanding, and stuff that we created ourselves. And again, we name the stages of evolution appropriate to fit these capability types. In this case, important to provide a visual legend so we don't get lost too easily on our maps. So here's what a map could look like. You see, it's a bit crowded, but let's dig into this. It visualizes the intended strategy that shall be applied. So this map helps us to communicate a certain strategy. The map itself is a tool for communication. By visualizing our strategy, we allow others to challenge our assumptions. And this can confirm our intent or prevent us from making expensive mistakes. Simon called this doing a pre-mortem in his keynote earlier today. Maybe you remember. So this is our battle plan, a detailed look at the example that I used, used earlier. And what do we see here? There's this contracting module I was talking about, which is clearly an artifact that is created through the software development uh, process. We want to move this artifact, this contracting module to the stage of sustainable planning. But we must overcome some inertia that has built up in the past. So this inertia, comes from missing knowledge of the contracting platform itself. The contracting platform is a product, as you can see here in the uh, visual legend. Circles stand for products. And as you can see, the product itself is evolved far enough 
But there's another thing that comes with this product, which is the platform documentation. And this is rather not evolved at all. It's somewhere left on the map, in the Genesis sector. So this might be the reason why our understanding, the triangle above it, the understanding, our understanding of this contracting platform is so poor also. And this map tells us a story about the strategy that we want to impose, a strategy that we want to apply to evolve our understanding. So what we see here is a movement that involves training and onboarding and workshops with a platform provider. We hope to evolve our understanding of the contracting platform further so that it helps us to overcome this inertia that comes from missing knowledge of the newly contracting platform. You see, you see other movements. We expect to gain more insights from a better version of this documentation, for example. And you see that there's another inertia in our way when we want to evolve the contracting module, which comes from lacking knowledge of our own processes. So the recipe here is to establish cross-functional teams with domain experts. This should tackle the inertia that we found in this stage. So. I was talking about five minutes now for, for this map, but this map is a visualization of an intended strategy. And by talking about that, by showing that map, by visualizing our strategy, it, we make it easy for others to challenge these assumptions, to talk about that strategy. If we find something that we missed out earlier, it's easy to adjust our strategy now. It's cheaper to adjust the strategy now that it's on a map than when we have applied it. So challenging our strategy might raise, raise questions like, is the value of documentation not overrated? Yeah, possibly so. So we can have a, a discussion about that now. What else is missing on the map? What did we miss out when, when creating the strategy? By opening our strategy to feedback for feedback from others, we choose a path which makes it kind of tangible, which is very different from how strategies are created in general. Okay, the final consideration that I'd like to advise to is to start with the given patterns from Simon's book and to add specific patterns for your domain as you discover them. You may not be aware of all the patterns that apply in your domain yet when you start, but you may find them later on. You don't have to apply every pattern that Simon wrote about or talked about it. They may not be applicable to your domain at all, but chances are that most of them are useful. So, Pick those that are useful for your domain. For example, inertia is something which is very common within software development. Things that created some success in the past are the things that uh, prevent us from moving forward. A software platform or stuff, stuff like that that we got used to is the reason why we are we're having a hard time in, in proceeding further. So inertia is a concept that I'd like to to see in my in in maps of my domain. But there are other concepts which are not so important for my for my domain, for my project, for my context. So this is my list with, with some marks on it for, for the patterns that I uh, frequently look after. And my advice is to make something similar for your domain. Find the patterns that fit well into your domain, into your context, and add your own patterns if you find them. So this ends up this adds up to be a kind of library, a library of patterns for your domain that you can revisit when you are examining examining a certain problem in your domain. Define new patterns specific to your domain if you can, and don't be afraid to leave some of the patterns out if they don't apply. Ditch what's not useful. And again, challenge your assumptions. Show your library to others. Questions may arise like, oh, what about this? Have you thought about pattern X, Y, or Z? 
why don't you uh, consider them as useful for your context? That's also very helpful. So with time, you have your own library of patterns for your domain, and hopefully they help you with, with the maps that you create later on. So this was my walkthrough on how to apply mapping to your domain. Keep these considerations in mind, explore and experiment with them. And one other final advice that I'd like to give, if you start mapping with others that didn't do any form of Wadley mapping before, don't explain the method beforehand. Don't start with a with a plain map and tell what is tell this is the evolution axis and this is about visibility and stuff like that. Just use it. Use the map because like Ben Mosher told, nobody cares about your framework. Yeah. It might be important to you, but not important to others. So just use Wardley maps, show them to others and let other people decide if they want to dive deeper. And then you can explain Wardley mapping to them. But I found it very useful to use maps in meetings, in workshops without explaining them upfront. Okay, then we've got some time left for either questions or for your experience from your domains. Anybody? Oh, I just found the chat. <laughs> Sorry for ignoring us. it. Okay. Yeah, Thomas wrote, most apps I've seen are a mess. <laughs> the reason you gave us perfection. Yeah. I mean, I created a lot of messy maps uh, in the past and I keep doing so because what I have in mind, what others have in mind is more often than not too big to put it on a single map. So it's okay to split it up in different maps, have two maps side by side to compare them with, with each other. That's at least my experience. Okay. Pablo asked what you did on that one map was projecting all the different dimensions of evolution around a single component and leaving out the rest. So what's, what's the question here? What's the comment? Pablo, you want to join? I'm happy to open up the discussion. I'm waiting for approval. How does that work? Ah, there we go. Nice. There we go. <laughs> hi, hi, Tom. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your talk. This was really nice. The, the, this one thing you did with the map. First, you showed the map with uh, a couple of components, and then you identified one which was central. And then what I saw is that you had like three different dimensions for the evolution. And uh, what you did, well, what I noticed, which I liked a lot, is that you picked only that one single component removed all the rest of the components and made a projection of all those three oh. different dimensions on the on the same map and it it remained readable exactly because here we have all the three dimensions with the with you have your component where you have, mm -hmm. want to move it and then the knowledge around the component and well i i can't give names for all the dimensions but uh, you you kept the content in such a way that the map remained readable and one of my questions usually, well, which shall I do a multi-dimensional map? And is it going to be readable? And you, you showed me a way on how to do it. And okay, I, I want to thank you so much for it. Okay. It's really helpful. I'm glad that it's, that it's helpful, helpful for you. Thanks for your feedback. What I'm, what I'm expecting, at least within my domain, is there's too many components that could be of, of potential interest to put them all on the map. So what I do is mm. mapping the, the high level and then digging deeper on specific maps. So I, I have a bunch of maps for a specific context. And one of the contexts could, could be about quality attributes. So we're mapping software components and we have a map for a certain quality attribute like maintainability, for example. Mm -hmm. This map um, contains the very same components like another map that deals with security aspects, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the components are placed on totally different places on the, on the map because that has a meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A component which is very far developed in terms of security may be very, very poor developed in terms of maintainability. Mm -hmm. And there's also trade-offs because when I 
develop a component towards a certain quality attribute, another attribute might suffer from that. Think about mm -hmm. security and usability. If we're mm -hmm. e developing, e evolving towards better security, this most certainly will affect usability. Two-factor yes. authorization is something you, you all know. It helps to to further apply security on, on a system, but it makes the system a little less usable, a little mm -hmm. harder to use. And maps are very, very helpful to visualize these trade-offs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. One, when when I think of evolution, I see it as every every single phase is kind of group. No, no. Let's say uh, different quality attributes which have more significance at a certain point than at the, another. Uh, for instance, in the experimental phase, it's more important to be changeable rather than maintainable. Or in, in, in commodity, you want to have something which is totally com maintainable, but you don't necessarily need something which changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of my questions always was, if, if I break it down into, into quality attributes, which one would I pick and where? But now I, I see that I can pick a couple of them and display only these in a specific map. Yeah, you can have specific maps for certain points of view. Mm -hmm. And every every aspect could be a map on its own. So pick the quality attributes for your context that are most important. And you don't have to put every component on every map. Just mm -hmm. put the ones that are strategic, of strategic importance for, for this aspect on the map. And then see what you can do with them. <laughs> see if you have to evolve certain characteristics or certain properties of a component to, to further evolve your context. Okay. I'm Thanks a lot. Through the, through, the, through the chat. Bye. See you later. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. I'm trying to catch up with with the chat. Okay. Thanks for all the for all the kind feedback. Anyone else? Any questions? Anyone uh, who'd like to enter the stage? Well, then I got a question. What are the contexts that you are working on? You can write it in the chat. Is there anybody who applied wardlay mapping to a certain context and had also this feeling of mm, it doesn't fit very well to my domain at first? I like the name of messymaps.com, by the way. <laughs> Great idea. Let's, let's register this domain so everybody can, can upload messy maps to it to, to, show, to show your experiments. And tell a story about why they were they went wrong. Leon wrote in the chat that uh, he sees a kind of link with the technology radar from ThoughtWorks. I heard this at another talk. Um, I'm hundred percent sure that you could put all the stuff from ThoughtWorks technology radar on a map and reason about this. So I think it's I haven't done this be uh, before, but I think it's it's a nice idea. And to do this in hindsight, to see what of the components from last year's technology radar evolved in the way that we, we expected it. Okay. Hi, Luis. Thanks for coming up to the stage. Hi. Yeah. I'm a bit shy maybe, but I, I liked a lot the, the idea you have. And, and, and I think it maps very well with architectural diagrams of software, right? In the end, you're decomposing a little bit the system. And one problem we face in the software domain or in the system domain when you're building something or trying to change something is architectural diagrams also get very messy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, and the problem is it's, it's a matter of scoping. And I have found that for architectural mapping uh, or architectural diagrams, C4 model as, as a framework works very well. I, I have no idea whether you know it, but it basically allows you to do some sort of Google maps of your architecture. So you see the context of it, your customers, third party systems you depend on for exchanging data or whatever. And then you zoom in into the bits that interest you. And it's basically the same correspondence to how you're doing their diagrams. <clears throat> and it just feels right how you're doing it. So, so I hadn't thought of it this way yet, but I, I think it, it maps even better with how I do architectural diagrams. So if, if, if you know the C4 model, I think it's, it's a great thing if, if you ever have to do this kind of analysis with the actual architecture, not just how you want to evolve it afterwards. Mm -hmm. 
just to to make it clear to everybody else, the C4 model is a kind of visual language to describe software architectures, and it's based on on abstractions. So we have a certain level of abstractions, and this enables us to have a high level view of the whole system, which is not too messy, which is easier to understand. Uh, which leaves out, out some important de uh, details, but we can see all these details when we move in the lower uh, levels of this, of this model. So yeah, the, the idea is, it's pretty much the idea that, that I had when, when I cr create uh, high level maps, let's, let's call them high level maps and <laughs> going further into detail. But the point here is abstractness is not the only uh, dimension for these maps. So it's not just high level and low level and more details within it. We can go in every, in every dimension. Uh, as I told earlier, one dimension could be, for example, quality attributes of a software system, or maybe the degree of how how much a system complies to its to its use cases. For example, how well is the system does does the system f uh, fit its original task? So there's a lot of stuff that we could put on a map. The question is, can you create a map which is useful for your context? We're not doing the maps because we can. We can show that some architectural concepts are we, we are able to to put them on a map and visualize them. The question is, is it helpful within our context? And one of the things that I found very very useful is to picture knowledge, to ask developer teams or the or to ask departments what do we know about a certain software system, the building blocks of a software system, or for example, what do we know about technologies? If somebody tells us, okay, you have to move to the cloud because cloud is the thing to do, and you, we expect you to do this by the end of the year, and this is what you have to, to use, it's a good idea to ask all the participants in this process, okay, what do you know about that? Do you even understand what you're talking about? Do you know the technologies? Do you know the processes? Do you know all the cultural stuff that it's all behind that? And put this, put this on a map. And the map that uh, comes out of such a mapping process might be shocking <laughs> because this self, this kind of self-assessment shows where a lot of effort has to be made. We have to, we have to put a lot of effort into building knowledge, for example. So mapping knowledge, mapping understanding is something that I found very useful. Certainly, and, and, and what I see here is by, by mapping the knowledge you have about a particular module allows you to focus in what is relevant for you right now, right? Because in the previous slides, you had all the other components you depend on, but that's not really the scope. The scope was the contracting module, which is what you're creating, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that allows you to, to zoom in and, and focus zero in what you, your team really needs. And I yeah. think this is just fantastic. Well, the most struggling part of this is tooling for me right now. So the most, uh, I'm, normally I'm using Miro, Miro boards to work with, with others and to create maps, which works pretty well, but it's not ideal to create models. It's good for sketches. It's good for, for, for workshops, but it's not a thing to, to create models or version models or stuff like that. So on my wish list is uh, a Wadley mapping tool that enables us to, to do all that stuff that we know from, from modeling, something like UML modeling tool for, for Wadley maps, but there's nothing like this available by now, but there's I mean, other there's... tools that I'd like, yeah. There's a plugin and that kind of works, right? I mean, at least you can keep it in the, your version control system. Yeah, that's that's a real that's that's real good. Yeah, MapKeep looks very promising to me. I don't know if anybody noticed that. It's I think it it came out four weeks ago, six weeks ago. It's not not long ago. Uh, a new tool which works online. I like it a lot, and yeah, maybe we are seeing more tools uh, coming up for for mapping. Okay. Any further comments? Who'd like to add on to this? Thanks, Luis. Okay. If there's no question, if there's no comments, oh, there's a Q and A tab. Oh, really? <laughs> Sorry, I have to. <laughs>
<laughs> I really have to get used to to the hopping stuff. I was just focused on the chat. Is it reasonable to add a third axis? And if so, what might its function be? What could be this third axis? Chris, you're still here? I mean, a third axis would would mean we, we could have a kind of three-dimensional Wardley map. I think this could look very interesting. I'm not sure if it's helpful. I think it would be very demanding to, to create, at least for me. Um, not sure what, what the purpose of this was. Okay, Steve asked, what are the most common domains you've seen that have impacted the evolution axis? Do you find they map well onto Simon's four stages or do they need to be shoehorned in? Hmm. When I started with mapping in my domain, I found this a lot, but then I realized that I don't have to be dogmatic on the on the labels for the evolution axis. So this is why I came up uh, with using custom labels for my specific project, for my specific domain in which I'm I'm working in. So I think the concept of evolution is, is very, very generic. We can use it for a broad, for almost everything that we'd like to map. So if we if we move away from using evolution as a concept, we're moving away away from Wardley mapping. So this is a it might be end up being a map, a different map. It might end up being helpful. So if it's helpful and if it's of value, why not? Just keep it. Just keep the concept. I don't think that we're talking about Wardley maps and all the uh, mechanics that we we use within Wardley mapping then. So for me, I think it's okay to to put the right labels on the evolution axis, and that makes it fitting to all the concepts that Simon described. So the major pain point for me in the beginning was to to find the the right labels and to map all this on the concept of evolution. And I also found some problems which are not related to evolution, and this is an, something that should be on a different kind of map, not necessarily on a Wardley map. Okay. Vicky, you wrote you'd like to hear more about the challenges that Gerard mentioned in the chat. Which one were? Which challenges? You'd like to join, come up on, space, uh, on the stage? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Gerard, for repeating. In the place I used to work, we struggled to apply Wardley maps to a product which largely had to implement existing standards. So could you tell more about um, the struggles? What was the problem? Because everything ended up being in the same stage or what was it? Okay. I think if you're dealing in an, with an environment that is highly standardized and you keep on uh, and you're stuck just with the normal labels of the evolution axis. It's easy to put everything in the same stage of evolution. So it's what I told earlier. You need to find the characteristics of the components, not if they are available as a standard or if they are uh, a commodity or a product. That is not uh, all, always helpful. But other characteristics might be like how well do we understand it? How easy it is for us to apply that? You can map that. You can map how easy it is for your company, for your organization to apply a certain technique, a certain technology, a certain methodology. You can map all that stuff. And that is probably more helpful than just mapping if it's available as a product, commodity, or if it's custom made. Because if you buy all the software components, yeah, you'll end up just in, in the stages three or four. But you're typically uh, more interested in other characteristics. Okay. Standards are meant to liberate, to be liberating, not constraining. Yeah, that uh, I'm afraid that depends on the standards. I'd love to have a discussion about this later on. I think it doesn't fit here anymore. But being a Java developer uh, means you're you're high, uh, used to standards which are not very liberating. <laughs> Which is that's just my point of view. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, Mark put it right. Standards could be novel, emerging, good or best. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's emerging standards. They have totally different characteristics to 
to standards which are there for for longer time these are the ones that could be constrained these, these are the ones that could be uh, kind of inertia okay chris you jumped up on stage want you share something some of your experience with that Oh, hi, Holger. You're here also. I am sorry. I'm the timekeeper. <laughs> I'm the timekeeper. You still got four minutes. <laughs> no, that's that's totally fine. <laughs> I think so, uh, one hour, uh, it, it's a good time slot for a presentation and you and all, a lot of Q&A, a great presentation, uh, Tom. And, but we are looking a little bit at the next next event. The sessions are, are, could start at the time and you can go to toilet and have, have, have a coffee or something i'll get myself a coffee okay <laughs> thanks to all of you thanks for the the feedback thanks for your questions it was a really good question and answer session i liked it a lot a lot and i hope you enjoy the rest of the map camp bye bye thank you, thank you tom bye bye great presentation